riled up are the strikes in the NHS. Now, you'll know that junior doctors are currently striking for the 10th time in their long-running pay dispute with the government. Five-day walkout got underway yesterday morning, with NHS bosses warning that it will cause major disruption. Hospital operations and checkups will be the worst hit, as half of doctors in hospitals are junior doctors. But it's been revealed this week, rather interestingly, that the leader of the junior doctor strike is no longer a junior doctor himself, so can't even join the picket lines. Dr Robert Lawrence, the co-chair of the BMA's Junior Doctors Committee, was registered as a fully qualified GP this month, but will still serve as the leader of the junior doctors until October, which has sparked some critics to question how he can still possibly lead calls for a 35% pay rise when he's no longer a junior doctor himself. Well, we're going to get some expert analysis on this by going to Dr Tony O'Sullivan, the co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public. Tony, it's, it's, it feels like a bit of an own goal, this one, doesn't it? Uh, good morning, Fiona. Morning. Good to speak to you. Um, I, I think it's a non-story, really. I mean, he's got a trade union position. Um, it, it, it's separate from his role as a doctor. Uh, he's qualified now in terms of being um, finishing his training to be a GP. Mm -hmm. And he is coming towards the end of his role as a trade union leader in the BMA. Uh, it's just a non-story, really. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing else to say. <laughs> there's no reason why he shouldn't be uh, leading the strike as a trade union representative, and he's doing his job. Well, th thanks, Ed. I'm keen to get to the, the nitty-gritty of this particular strike. Um, the majority of this is about pay, but is there more behind it? There must be something about working conditions here, too. Um, it really is more, a lot more mm -hmm. uh, than just pay. Pay is really important. I'm sure you know that you know the junior doctors now are they've just crept up to about 15 pounds an hour uh, at starting. Um, Childcare is about a thousand pounds a month, so it's half their salary. Sometimes there are other issues like car parking, a thousand pounds a year. It's not just for doctors; it's for lots of NHS staff doing late shifts. You know, women at night, especially at very early morning, uh, there are dangers there thousands and thousands of pounds in exam fees and student debt of between 70 and a hundred thousand pounds but it, it, it is more about that it, it's about um the the, the the it's a really intense job um you you know during covid 2100 health and social care people died during uh, frontline work they the doctors junior doctors don't even have a kind of mess area or quiet area where they can plan their care and write up their reports there's nowhere for them to get hot food or during the night there's, there's all sorts of issues where they're that they feel undervalued and undermined and they would be the first to say it's not just about doctors it's about the intense pressure on the nhs 170,000 people have left the nhs in one year alone um, and the doctor vacancies are really damaging. Over 8,700 doctors posts are, are, are vacant in NHS trusts, and that doesn't even, even include the, doc, uh, the GPs, where there's 4,200 GP vacancies. So it, it's, it's a massive understaffing, uh, a massive increase in pressure, and then the position of the government which is really failing to negotiate properly with them and there's such a such a long period now of undervaluing the nhs to the point where if we were in germany there would be 50 percent more doctors than in england per per head of the population mm -hmm. you're you're quite right it's a lot more than money and I feel the doctors, alongside all the other uh, NHS staff that have had to go on strike, are saying, if we don't sort this out, the government is undermining the future of the NHS. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, 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 I say this as someone, I used to live with two junior doctors when I was at university, um, mm. and they, they would, you know, uh, complain, probably rightly, about, about some of the, the points that you've mentioned there. But they kind of took it on the chin and just knew that was part of the role of being a junior doctor. That's what they expected. But knowing that it would lead to them going on to be fully qualified and then reaping the benefits of the career later in life, 
do, do you think there's an element of that that the, the, the junior doctors perhaps need to suck it up a bit they know what they're letting themselves in for but knowing that they'll be sort of you know valued and properly recuperated later on in their careers well i'm not sure when you were at university but um <laughs> over the last 10 years um the the drop in value of pay is enormous as you as you know that the drop since 2008 is 26 percent so there's a, a really dramatic hit on the economic well-being of of junior doctors and of course on top of the intense pressures that they are facing and the demoralized the, the demoralization that they and other sections of the nhs workforce they're they're, they're deciding maybe to give up medicine or to leave the UK, to go to Ireland, to go to Australia. And they don't do that lightly. You know, they, 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 they're from this country, they're trained in this country. Why would they just decide to desert the NHS that they're, that they're proud of? So the fact that four in 10 junior doctors, newly qualified, uh, newly into the NHS are planning to consider leaving the NHS. The fact that 40% of doctors leave the NHS already within eight years of qualifying. That is a shocking position. And the government really has to bear responsibility for this and take responsibility and act. And, and I, I, think, I think we should compare what's happened in Scotland, for example, where the Scottish government negotiated with the BMA. There hasn't been any doctor strikes in Scotland. And there's been a commitment to say, yes, your pay has been eroded. Yes, you do need a pay increase. We can't sort this over, sort all this out overnight. We know that, but they've agreed with the BMA in Scotland that they will address this over the coming short period of years. Mm -hmm. And the government has absolutely refused to do that. Well, can, can we talk about this in, in the context, the wider context, as you've rightly touched upon, of the kind of NHS workforce plan? Because the government, uh, to great fanfare, um, uh, produced this recently. But there was a story today in the Observer saying that actually uh, the plans to double the number of student doctors um, looks as though it's going to be delayed. What do you make of this? I, I think it's shocking. It's, it's cynical. It's, it's almost like saying we're coming up to the election. So uh, any plans that that require a commitment financially to invest in the NHS can be shelved and leave it for the next government. I'd, I'm not sure if you remember, I mean, there, there are so many people, you know, young people, journalists, uh, politicians, who would have to have a memory that goes back 15 years to 2009 to, to know that at that point, the NHS was abs absolutely thriving. It was no, by no means perfect. But we, we, we know that the NHS, when it's funded to succeed and um, not funded to fail, has been in the past and will be again the best health service in the world. But in 2010, one of the first decisions of David Cameron and George Osborne in the Conservative-led coalition was to shelve plans to expand medical school places. And in addition, they cut 4,000 nurse training university places. So at that very moment, they set in train the growing crisis of under-resourcement of doctors and nurses in the NHS. The, the workforce plan that was, uh, that was finally published in June last year was, you know, more than more than the Tory term of office uh, in, in its in its coming, it was more than twenty years before mm -hmm. since this one. But for fourteen years, they've underfunded the NHS. The workforce has, crisis has been growing, and they, and they finally made this plan last year. And now they are reneging on that plan, so that for the for the uh, the year ahead in two thousand and twenty five twenty six, they're only planning now to to fund a quarter of the planned places. And that's left many medical schools in, in disarray where their plans were already firmly made to start the expansion of health service, of, uh, sorry, of medical school training places that they know we desperately need. I mean, it, it takes 10 or 15 years to get the, you know, the, the oncologists and the ca cardiac surgeons and the anesthetists that we desperately need. So it's a shocking announcement or, or a revelation that's been published in The Observer, and it, I'm afraid it's a disgrace.
Well, well, one thing I, I want to kind of come back to you on, you, you've talked about kind of longer term underfunding of the NHS, and yet I think I'm right in saying that the, the budget in real terms has increased pretty much year on year since the Conservatives came into power, and I think it's at, at record levels now as a percentage of GDP, etc. I mean, how would you respond to that? Clearly, there are deeper challenges than just funding here, and yet funding is, is the key thing that people sort of call upon as a silver bullet to fix everything. Right. So... Um, it's a, a really good question, and it's a, a question that I'm asked in, in every interview. Mm -hmm. but what does record funding mean? You know, if if the budget goes up one pound next year, it's record funding. But if you um, assess the funding of the NHS according to the need, the rise of the population, mm -hmm. which is several million since 2010, uh, if you if you assess it according to the r rising age of the population. Mm -hmm also the growing complexity of the population, not least of which is the tens of thousands of people with long COVID and the, uh, and the, the massive uh, epidemic of mental health distress uh, over the last few years, then the, the funding according to need has actually flatlined or gone down over the last 14 years. And if you compare a country that we could very easily compare ourselves with economically, for example, France or mm -hmm. Germany, the Health Foundation and the King's Fund and the Nuffield Trust, all these uh, reputable think tanks say that the NHS is, has been underfunded by between 40 and 70 billion pounds a year, not, not in total, but a year since 2010, 11, 12. Right. And, and that is why we have uh, no workforce plan that's been funded by Jeremy Hunt. That is, that is why we have uh, hospital ceilings falling down. That is why we have waiting lists of six and a half million people waiting for seven and a half million appointments mm. and tests. So those are the very real consequences of underfunding, as well as the diversion of money in a very disreputable way to private companies on, on PPE or on ophthalmology, cataract surgery, gravy trains, whereas we should be building back the NHS so that it can be once again one of the best health systems in the world. Well, Dr. Tony O'Sullivan there giving his insights on the junior doctor strikes and, and wider issues around NHS waiting lists. Thank you very much for that. And very quickly, I'm going to bring in Anne from Hertfordshire, because earlier on 